When we uh, try to, uh, to get some speakers for a web acceleration, um, oh, it's actually another thing that we, we, we tried. Well, I, I, I asked Paul Henningkamp, do you want to come to, to, the, to the Netherlands? And he said, well, I'm so busy and my, my uh, daughter is graduating and everything. And everything. So he said, well, I know this guy called Per Beur. It's Beur, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, well, um, I trust him completely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sort of a consolation prize for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you were aiming for this other guy, but he was busy, so you get me. Yeah. But then I got yeah. in, into contact with him, and uh, <laughs> it's, it, yeah, it's a great story. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you. That's the best introduction I've ever had, I think. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so who am I? My name is Per Bur. Uh, I'm the founder and CTO of Varnish Software. Uh, my background is uh, basically I was uh, started out as a programmer in 1995. Uh, I think I actually sort of was one of the first to spend a significant amount of time actually programming JavaScript for uh, for uh, for a living back then. Uh, then I was I worked as a sysadmin for 11 years. Uh, and then I uh, basically uh, spun, made, up, made a company around Varnish, Varnish Cash. Yeah. The company's name is Varnish Software, so yeah, we sell basically we're your traditional commercial entity that's associated with an open source product. Uh, so like, what's Varnish? So the basic idea is, I mean, you have some sort of client, you have some sort of content, you stick Varnish in the middle, the client sort of talks through Varnish, Varnish will retain a copy of that content typically, and then it might sort of do something with that content whenever it passes through. The most typical thing is to sort of cache the content, that's what most people use it for, but there's, my, there's a, like one of the biggest installations of Varnish out there is uh, Pinterest. Uh, so this is sort of just a counter example uh, to just to sort of mess with you a bit uh, because they don't like they deployed I think uh, varnish two and a half years ago and we noticed because they started showing with varnish headers uh, and then we were trying to get a cache hit from pinterest.com and no matter what we do we couldn't get a cache hit so we thought okay that sort of they, they screwed up uh, <laughs> they're, they're not the first to do that. Um, and then it turns out they were not using, they were not interested in actually caching at all. What they were actually using it for was they found out that that was the best and most efficient way for them to get an intelligent load balancer that was spe specifically adapted to their architecture. The problem that they were having as uh, they had, I think they were running approximately a thousand front-end servers. Uh, so, uh, 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 I think Python application servers. Uh, and so, when they were doing an uh, upgrade, uh, they were rolling that upgrade out at, uh, I think it takes them an hour to upgrade all their servers. And during that hour, uh, there's problem with front-end and back-end compatibility. So, they have JavaScript application, uh, and then uh, Python backend, and as you do the rolling upgrade, if you bump the API level, you want the client to sort of be sticky, so it only gets that bump once, because that bump will mean that you have a full client reload. Now, if you buy like a off-the-shelf load balancer, that's not one of the features that you get. Uh, so, of course, they needed some way to do that, to, to inject that logic into the HTTP. And uh, so that's basically why they used, used Varnish. And that's quite actually typical. There's quite a few organizations that do stuff like that with, with Varnish that not, are not interested in caching at all. So, the design of Varnish is, is yeah, well, it's, it's basically an HTTP server with an HTTP backend. So we can't really serve files. Uh, we, we can actually, we have a sort of module uh, to the, <laughs> it was one of the features that we added in the absolute latest of version of Varnish, that we can now actually serve files, <laughs> which is, um, yeah. But it, uh, it's a threaded architecture, so to differentiate between Nginx, Nginx has an event loop, we don't. Uh, 
that gives us uh, one thing that sort of makes it easier is that when you write your code for Varnish, it's, you can actually use blocking system calls. Uh, so we see quite actually quite a few modules, and it's quite easy to write Varnish modules uh, compared to Apache and Nginx modules where you have to deal with the event loop. Uh, but again, again, it's slightly more costly to have a thread uh, than uh, event loop. Uh, the, the, th the third point here is that it, we have a weird uh, way of logging. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we log to shared memory. We don't log to disk. We don't have that. Uh, we have. The point of that is logging is if you're running a server and it's dealing with 10,000 HTTP transactions every second, the logging actually becomes really expensive, specifically with rotating hard drives. And who actually reads the logs? I mean, the only the only ones who's interested in that server log is probably the NSA or something. I mean, you don't use actually logs for 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 that much these days. Uh, so what Varnish does is that it logs everything. It logs approximately 200 lines per request. So it logs every client header, uh, every sort of transformation that happens on that object is logged in detail, but it's logged into memory. And if nobody's looking for that information, it just gets overwritten because it's a circular buffer. So that's sort of, uh, I would say, uh, yeah. it's. I think I saw a patch to Squid once, which was the, the name the Varnish style logging. So that's it's basically Varnish style logging. Varnish is the only application I know of that does that. But the big thing, which is why sort of Varnish kind of gets sort of sticky in the organizations that it gets deployed, is that it has this this uh, uh, different configuration. Uh, so this is all. This was basically the, a feature that was there from 1.0, um, back as approximately 10 years old now. Varnish doesn't have a traditional configuration file, like Apache or, or, or any other sort of program out there. It basically has a bunch of policies. Those policies are written in a sort of specific language, and they are compiled into native code, and that native code is then run. So that I'll basically the rest of the talk is about that. Also, Varnish is sort of a bit like a toolbox. It has something to do with Paul Henning, the way he architected it. It's basically, it's, it's I mean, it's written very much sort of in the sort of Unix ethos that that is sort of instead of giving you a a, a fixed product that sort of fits in nicely in a box, we give you a set of tools and you can combine those tools as you want. Uh, so, just like a, a, a key feature of a sort of uh, caching reverse proxy is sort of purging. And Varnish doesn't support that <laughs> out of the box. Uh, when you download and install Varnish, and if you're trying to update the cache actually and purge out the old object, there is no way you can do that with the default configuration. Oh, there, there is one way, but. So, it's sort of some assembly required. Uh, and it's an interesting question whether this is a winning strategy or not. If we should start shipping this code uh, w with the default configuration. My idea is that we should not do it because we, we want to sort of, we want the user to get some dirt under the nails and when they actually they need to touch the configuration a bit. So the, the configuration needed to sort of set up purging, it's super simple. So this is basically the, uh, I'll, I'll, just ignore the, the, the sub stuff and all that. Basically it says, it, uh, the question is, so if the request method is purge, then return purge. Basically uh, call, the, uh, call purge. Yeah. And that purges the content. So you can sort of, if you do it slightly more advanced, and this is one of the reasons why we don't ship this in the default configuration, is that you probably don't want anyone on the internet to be able to purge content on your, from your cache. Uh, so we set up an ACL, so only limit access to purging to, to this specific thing here. But yeah, as you can see, there's no laser pointer here, is it? No. Okay. Um, yeah. So as you can see, sort of, 
uh, so we do the if request method is purge, and then we if the client IP doesn't. Oh, you have that. Excellent. Like this, yeah. Oh, super nice. Thank you. Um, so if yeah, if the client IP uh, matches the purge ACL, so this one. If it doesn't batch that, then we return not allowed. If, and if that doesn't go through, then we do the return purchase. So, I think like the actual reasons why this one is written this way is because we're lazy. And so instead of actually writing every feature out there, we basically came up with a framework that allows the user to implement every feature they need for themselves. The first sort of user contributed feature that I saw was uh, a feature that allowed a user to use Varnish to limit hot linking. So hot linking is basically this. So you basically steal someone else's resources on the web. I have write a blog post about it, and I use Shannon's uh, pictures or something, uh, because like unicorns, uh, and they illustrate my blog post very well. And then Shannon has to pay the bandwidth bill. This is excellent since we're actually sort of competitors. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, so, so the, the like, uh, we didn't even know at the time, so this was taken from a blog post back in 2008. I think then we learned actually what hot linking was. Uh, and some guy out there who just saw this, saw this tool and sort of written VCL for it uh, himself and sort of and then did a blog post, and then sort of other users could sort of copy and paste from his configuration, and they would have a server that's capable of blocking hot linking. So I modified the example a bit, but it's, it looks something like this. So first here we load a module. So Varnish has modules. So uh, I think there's approximately 100 modules available. Uh, as I said, they're very simple. If, if we have one of the sort of summits in your city ever, and you want to write modules, one of the things we do on a summit is a workshop where we teach people to write modules. It's quite simple, really. So we import this module here, and this is a throttle module to do throttling, uh, because I try to make it slightly more advanced than I usually do. Uh, but th so the semantics here are if the request URL matches assets, and the refer does not match example.com, because that's my blog. And that's a logical and there. And VS throttle, so that's I'm calling into this module now, so into its namespace, is denied. And the is denied function, that's the throttle function, it has the key that it's used for the throttling. So, and the throttling, we use the URL for the key. And then we uh, parameter, parameters here are 10 and 60s. That means 10 times per 60 seconds, we are allowed to serve this uh, URL, every URL under slash assets that doesn't have this as its refer. And if that hits, then we just throw uh, error 403 with hot linking prohibited. Kind of neat. Uh, and you can sort of easily expand that to use, for instance, memcache instead, so you get a central sort of uh, accounting in your cluster. So, more things you should know. So these aren't exactly neat things, but I mean the kind of thing. Varnish will not ca cache content requested with cookies, or it will not deliver a cache hit if, you're, if, it has, if the request has a cookie associated with it. Kind of, it's sort of stop, a lot of users stumble on that uh, when they initially install Varnish. Solution is basically just strip the cookie. Uh, so we need because Varnish doesn't know if this cookie should actually influence the content or not. So it's an open question, not whether we, we were too conservative when we decided that that we're not going to do uh, content with cookies. Yeah. So there's a vmod out there which is called cookie to make cookies uh, easier. Those of you who are real men will of course you just use the built-in regular expressions to filter out the cookies. <laughs> but but uh, for the rest of us there's a cookie module uh, and it looks something like this. Yeah. More things to know? Yeah. 
Varnish doesn't like the set cookie header as well. When it sees the backend is sending a set cookie header, it will not cache that object naturally. So solution, yeah, remove the set cookie header or fix the back, fix the backend, of course. Now, uh, there's something in Varnish called grace mode. Uh, it's one of those features that we couldn't come up with a name that sort of was intuitive enough. So we gave it a really weird name to try to force people uh, to read the documentation. <laughs> <laughs> because like, we fucked up once uh, where we had this feature in Varnish called bans. Like bans, they are sort of cache, mass cache invalidations. And uh, like half of the people out there thinks that bans are somehow a feature to lock people out of your website, and it's actually cache invalidation. So, like, it, yeah. So that was a bad, bad idea. <laughs> so now we we give them these uh, esoteric names <laughs> instead. <laughs> so there's a thing called grace mode. Um, grace mode allowed Varnish to serve outdated content if new content isn't available, or if it might be faster to serve the old content. Um, this was actually a sort of a thing that we did for completely different reasons. Uh, we did it actually because we had, like in Varnish 1.0, we had massive problems with thread pileups. Uh, this because sort of one web Varnish website was very, very busy. It was a newspaper. Uh, their front page was delivered 3,000 times every second. Now they had a CMS, and every CMS is dog slow. Like, I haven't seen that CMS, which actually sort of is fast. Uh, so that CMS would use three seconds to regenerate the front page. The problem is, at some point, if you follow sort of the RFCs, the proxy cache will invalidate that uh, front page, or it will time out. Then a user comes along, and we need to fetch a new version of the front page. Now Varnish does cache coalescing. So if another user comes along, he will be put on a waiting list. And that, I think, is like Varnish is one of the few caches that does that. Other caches tend to send the next user to the backend as well, which sort of kills the backend. But anyway, uh, so Varnish will put that user on the waiting list. So the problem is, of course, is that every second, 3,000 more users are being added to that waiting list. And after the three seconds, uh, 9,000 users were waiting for that piece of content, and then sort of the backend delivers it, and then Varnish would take that piece of content, talk to its 9,000 threads, and then try to push it all out at once. Uh, it's called a thundering herd, and it instantly killed the server. Uh, <laughs> one of the reasons that we did a bunch of things, basically, to, to sort of stop that, but one of the reasons why, why don't we just reuse that old uh, front page? If we're waiting for the server to regenerate the content, we just might serve the old one. Because, like, who knows like, if the content is, like, 20 seconds out of date, nobody cares. Like, I mean, unless you're doing real-time sort of financial stuff, like, 20 seconds, who cares? Nobody. Uh, so, the semantics of grace have changed slightly over the years. Uh, in 4.0, in it changed again, and it's now, if you enable it, and you enable it like this, so I'll in uh, some, this, these things here will make more sense <laughs> in a while, just ignore them currently. But basically what you do here is you set on the backend response object, that's bresp, you set dot grace to two minutes, and then Varnish will keep an object two minutes past its TTL. And if, if uh, in that time it is requested, it will prefer to serve something that's in cache to something that's out of cache. So it actually will serve that, con the default configuration is that if you enable it, it will use that object and then it will asynchronously refresh the object. Now, one thing that's cool about Varnish is you can sort of, you can open the hood a bit, you don't have to necessarily read the source code, but there's a default VCL that's sort of where we, can, where we try to put as much of the semantics as we can. And so a feature such as Grace, you can actually read the VCL itself and see what it does. So this one is rather simple. So if the object TTL is more 
than zero seconds. So if it has a positive TTL, so then we just serve it, return the delivery. Great. If the object TTL plus the grace, and this one is inherited from the B resp grace that we set earlier, if this one is more than zero seconds, <laughs> then it is in grace, deliver it, and this automatically triggers a background fetch. So we still deliver it, and then Varnish will in magically in the background go and refetch the object. But if, if the object TTL plus the grace is less than zero seconds, then we just block and we fetch it. Why not fetch only the seconds per line, yeah? First code is in that if the first case. Uh, so the question was, why does this exist? Why not just have this here? I think it's to make it uh, clear as you've, that those are different cases. Uh, because we might want to modify these semantics. So I just added this is the one a typical, uh, let's say that we are uh, we're dealing with uh, uh, financial instruments or something and we, we're very, very reluctant to serve uh, content that's out of date. We can do something like this. So the first bit here, you know, is, is unchanged. Uh, the second bit, we, I've completely rewrote it. So it says, if std.healthy, which is, is this backend healthy? This backend here, which is the one that's uh, serving the current request. If it's healthy, and if the uh, TTL plus grace is more than zero seconds, then we do deliver but only if the backend is not healthy. So the exclamation mark there, I might have misread it. So you see, so was that clear? Yeah. Okay, a couple of things you might wonder about at this point. What's bresp? <laughs> yeah, you have the rec, which is the request object. That's rather simple, so that's a client request. Then you have brec which is the backend request. Backend request, of course, is when Varnish talks to the backend, it creates a request that is the brec object. At some point, we might want to modify that. Then there's the backend response. Then there is the response, which is Varnish's response to the client. And then there's obj, which is the object in memory. Of course, we're sort of all Unix geeks, every one of them, and we're sort of very skimpy on the number of characters we'll assign to anything. So, yeah, that's why I call it rec, and of course not request, because that would be wasteful. Um, there's also one thing you should know about sort of varnish. It has this internal state machine, and you have seen this earlier. Uh, you might have seen sub VCL resv, which is, stands for VCL receive. So, uh, every, let's see, how am I on time, by the way? 15, 30, yeah, we're fine. Yes, so uh, you guys can interrupt me with questions, you know that, right? Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, Varnish has a state machine. So this, uh, every request that goes through Varnish goes through various stages, vari uh, these states here. Uh, and at every state, custom code is run. So this VCL code gets run at every one of those states. So typically, you might put some code in VCL receive. That code is used to modify the request object somehow if you need that. If you don't want to re uh, remove cookies, you might want to do that. Then after that user-specific uh, code is, is run, then Varnish will decide is this a hit or a miss, and it will then run VCL hit or VCL miss. If it's a hit, then it'll, the next one will be VCL deliver, where we basically will run some VCL code just before we push the object out to the client. Then there's miss, backend fetch. Uh, miss, of course, is obvious, so in this state, we know that we don't have a cache hit. Uh, in this state, uh, we, are, we are preparing to talk to the backend. And in this state, backend response, we have just received the object from the backend. 
and we can sort of modify it and strip any set cookie headers or something, and then we deliver it. And then there are two, the two red states here, which are synth, which is for synthetic content. So you want to synthesize some content inside of Varnish. If you want to write your speedy CMS in Varnish or do something crazy like that, then you can do that here. Uh, or you have the uh, uh, backend error, which is an error state that you're thrown into if the backend doesn't respond properly. Okay, I think there are a couple of other states as well, but this is the ones that you need to know. 90% of the user-specific changes happen here, then the 8% happen here. So these are the ones that you should care about. So, I was told to talk about tuning as well. Uh, now, yeah, I'm going to talk about tuning on Linux because who here is not using Linux? Wow, really? Yeah, I wasn't sure when I got here if the uh, NLUG was from Netherlands Linux users uh, user group or if it was NL Unix user group. I, I thought it was the latter, uh, but uh, yeah, Linux is all. Hmm? Yes, I know. Okay, so I'm going to talk about tuning Linux, uh, but besides that's the easiest uh, part. Uh, if you're using Unix, you, you typically know all this stuff. Um, a couple of things. Uh, so l l Linux, you know, sort of performance. Uh, I don't know if it's true, but like Linus Torvalds used to say that the way that he would performance test the Linux kernel was that he would compile the kernel and then he would play in Minesweeper and browse the internet. Like, that's the way he would make sure that performance was where it was supposed to be. Now, um, and, that, and, and this guy writes our kernel, and we use that to serve like 10,000 of requests per second. And that's the guy, that's the way he does performance testing. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not as bad as that, I, I think. Um, but the, 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 there are some tunables in Linux that are very conservatively set. Uh, these two are the ones that annoy me the most. Uh, SOMAXCON and TCPMAX in backlog. SOMAXCON, SOMAXCON because uh, like that's the listen depth, the, 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 the depth of the, so when we listen to the socket, uh, Varnish will uh, spend uh, a couple of threads to accepting incoming connections, so accept call. Uh, if those threads get busy, we might want, the kernel will start to queue up. How long that queue should be, that queue is not allowed to grow beyond SOMAXCOM. This, even though VarnishD starts up with the root privileges, VarnishD will start up with the root privileges and ask for 1024 uh, connections in the listen depth queue. But the kernel just overrides that and say that no, you get 128. Which sort of really bugs me because like Varnish runs with root privileges, it should be able to sort of decide its own listen depth, but of course uh, Linux knows best. So, uh, so you might want to up that. The, the upside of upping it is that you reduce the risk of rejecting connections. Because what happens if you're out of listen depth is that you start rejecting connections. Now there's this other sort of school of thought that says uh, fail early, fail, fail often, uh, where basically if you if you if your listen depth needs to grow beyond 128 connections, then you're screwed anyway, and you want to fail the users as quickly as possible because the user like they like more to see an error page than to have the spinning I don't know like ball or something, yeah. Whatever. The TCP max sin backlog is basically a lot of like the same. That's how many um, outstanding connections that can be within the sort of three way handshake uh, before the kernel assumes that it's being attacked. Uh, I think that's uh, that's the semantics of it. So if, it, if that's, that, that number is also, I think the default, I think, is 128. 
what we've seen is that would, if you have these flash, flash mobs forming on the internet and they go after your site uh, the, in a positive way, uh, Justin Bieber, I think, was like uh, tweeted a link to your web app or something, uh, of course, your traffic might be more. Uh, you have, might have more than 128 incoming new TCP connections per second. Yes, whatever you do, don't mess with TCP TV recycle. Just sort of saying what you shouldn't do. Uh, also, take great care when Googling these things. There's a lot of dumbasses on, on the net. <laughs> uh, this one has a funny story. Uh, there's a, a French open source project called HAProxy, which I'm a sort of, we like the, them. They're sort of, uh, uh, we, we've worked on them with, with, uh, uh, on a few things. Uh, uh, you know, HTTP proxies sometimes gets into pissing uh, contests where, like, who can do the most number of HTTP transactions per second? And I think um, HA proxy guys wanted to go get past one million HTTP transactions uh, per second. Uh, and so, like, the problem with like getting one million HTTP transactions through one server is that you 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 have problems generating one million HTTP transactions. Like that becomes a real issue, because like both nginx, uh, varnish, HA proxy, we spent all more than ten years on optimizing every bit of our code. Uh, uh, like Apache Bench or Siege or something is, is looks like it's thrown together in an afternoon, <laughs> and it's not very performant. So you typically need like ten times the load in order to sort of put a proper strain on it. So that, that of, so one of the things that the HA proxy guy did to sort of get that number of connections was to use this one, and that's completely safe on the local area network. But if you don't use it, use it on the internet, and if you have clients that are connecting to a net, they will be basically blocked out. So we did a blog post, I think, about this, or yeah, and it mentioned his configuration, and this line got was in that blog post. And of course, it said at the bottom, don't ever use this in production. This is crazy. You should not ever use this. But if you want to do one million transactions per second on your local area network, then you can do this. Of course, like who leads the, reads the whole blog post? Like, yeah, you read like one million HTTP transactions. I use this config. Yeah, copy, paste. <laughs> <laughs> So of course now, and that of course got, got like, it's got, got picked up like by ten other blogs, and so there's like the people saying like ah, I had a lot of connections in this in the time wait state, and then I put I put this thing on, and everyone was and they all went away. Uh, yeah, well, okay. Uh, also, I'm not going to talk about workspace tuning in Varnish, but there are workspaces in Varnish. So workspaces basically is local memory that's in each thread. Because malloc is expensive, we don't malloc every time we need a bit of memory. We pre-allocate memory to each thread. If you're doing a lot of VCL operations, manipulating strings, doing back and forth, a lot of stuff like that, that will burn up all the workspace. Uh, and that might lead to, yeah, so tuning. Tuning uh, varnish, you should be aware that there are workspaces and that you might uh, uh, run out of them. Don't do connection tracking, like don't load the uh, contract module, net filter contract, uh, because it's dead slow. And uh, the default, I think, is for varnish to run with five threads or something, or ten, th ten threads. I can't remember the default. Uh, it's relatively quick to spin up new threads. But uh, if you're having planning on doing like a thousand connections per second, make a thousand threads. Uh, that's our sort of very uh, unscientific uh, thread scaling. But then you have like the, then yeah, up the, there's a parameter for pre-allocating threads. Yes, uh, bonus content. <laughs> We're sort of uh, we have time to sort of uh, go into a bit of extras. So yeah, like. One of the features we didn't build was Varnish can't redirect. Like, you want to do an HTTP 301 uh, redirection? We don't do that. But you can do it yourself. And this is the code that's needed. So basically, this is a showcase of the VCL synth method, where we synthesize content inside of Varnish. Maybe I should point a bit here. 
Um, so what we do here is a bit cheeky, really. We take the uh, RESP status, so this is the HTTP response code. So we get called into VCL synth with an HTTP response code. You see later how this is invoked. If the code is 750, which is bogus because they don't go past 500 and something, then we know it's a redirection. So what we do then is we set the HTTP header location, which is how redirection actually happens. We set it to HTTP colon slash slash and then to the current host and then to the current value of recurrent URL. And we set the status from 750 to 301 and then we push that out to the client. This is called something like this. So you have if the host is devexample.com and if the URL begins with slash archives slash, then set the URL to regsub, which is regular expression matching. You guys all know regular expressions, I expect, uh, since you're old Unix farts. Uh, <laughs> do the reg sub on rec URL, which is where Varnish stores the URL. Uh, yeah, there's a logical mistake here. I've wrote this slide yesterday after a beer. <laughs> they were supposed to switch these two around. Uh, so this is the regular expression that's applied. Of course, it will never match because I fucked up. Uh, so yeah, there's, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, let, let's just pretend that it says archives and then a capturing parenthesis. Capturing parenthesis will uh, capture whatever yeah, in the parenthesis and it's then available as backslash one here. Yeah, I'm not going to teach you regular expressions in, in 30 seconds, so if you didn't, yeah. So, and then we set the host and then we do return synth 750 moved permanently. If we go back to this one, you see. We, we get thrown in here because we did return synth. 750 is the status code, so that gets us in into the if 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 block. Yes. Oh. Oh, just to, because it's uh, sort of uh, uh, because I want to do redirections all over. Yeah. Yes, error. Okay, so uh, the question was, is there a difference between VCL synth and VCL error? VCL synth used to be called VCL error. Yes, and I do, I do trainings from time to time and sort of try to explain. So like a trainee asks, like, how do I do redirections? And then I go, well, in VCL error, but then the trainee goes, but this is not an error. No, I know, but just ignore that. Uh, and <laughs> there's a, there, like, if you get asked that enough, like, you, you try to reduce the sort of cognitive dissonance as much as possible. Um, yeah, it's, it's already problematic enough with the bands that I mentioned earlier. But the VCL since used to be uh, called VCL error. Okay. <clears throat> um, so we actually have 10 minutes left. Okay, so idea is not covered in this talk. So I didn't really talk about the shared memory logging. Uh, there's one, like, there are a couple of neat things which I didn't cover when I not covered it earlier. Uh, and that is, like, you can actually, like, it has a query language. So it's a bit like, sort of, it's a, more a log stream than a log. By the way, like, if you are considering writing some sort of high performance application, like have a look at Varnish and have a look at how the logging is done there. Like one of the really neat things about it is that in Varnish, the log always runs with full debugging. Like as I said, we run, log a shit ton of stuff. If, and uh, like one of the things I learned to really hate in my 10 or 11 years as a sysadmin is that let's say that we have this huge Java application server and it would crash once a week. So what do we do? Like, like nobody knows why it's crashing. Okay, well, we expect it's a, some sort of race condition. Uh, developer is gone. Uh, so we're gonna try to debug this. So let's put on debug logging. 
and we, we see we figure out where the race condition is. Of course, if you put on full debug logging, the race condition goes away because we now slow the application down enough so that the actually race condition doesn't happen anymore. We used to call refer to this as Heisenbugs uh, because sort of. <laughs> because the bug is there unless you observe it. Because if you're trying to observe it, it's fucking gone. <laughs> so, um, and like Varnish doesn't, doesn't suffer from this because it always runs with full debugging. Uh, so you can do the same thing. You don't have to do the, the shared, you don't have to do it in a so POSIX shared memory fashion. You can just do it internally if you have a threaded application and just have some one of the threads listen to a socket and then when somebody connects to a socket you start spitting out log to that to that socket and that also gets the logging out of the critical performance path i think it's a wonderful pattern and uh, yeah maybe we'll do a generic library uh, on this one day uh, yeah but, but, but so this this log stream had then we also built like uh, in the uh, release we had one and a half years ago we did a, a query language uh, a query language for a log stream that sounds weird but you guys are all familiar with snoop or uh, tcp dump uh, and tcp dump has a query language because like if you ever try to stare at a full gigabit packet dump, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. <laughs> not uh, like, like not uh, even talking about the, the terminal having issues keeping up. Uh, but the same thing is with sort of varnish. We log like 200, 000, no, 200 lines per second. Let's say that's a thousand transactions per second. That's 200,000 lines of log per second. I don't think your terminal can do that. Uh, so, of course, you need some sort of query language. And that, so that query language gives you the possibility to sort of filter out the things that you want. So I always recommend having one of these uh, uh, queries running continuously that log everything that has uh, an error code uh, higher than 500. So that, that gives you sort of, if some, or log everything where we use more than 0 0.5 seconds to deliver it to the client because you shouldn't do more than 0 0.5 seconds to deliver something to the client yes uh, bands yeah I just yeah we already mentioned them yeah uh, those are as asynchronous filter expressions that mass invalidate every every uh, so like, yeah if you want to so for instance kill all PDFs from the cache because we found out that they've been written by I don't know an infected uh, PDF generator or something and they're all corrupt or we need to regenerate every PNG or every URL that's beginning with slash foo slash or something so you can sort of just issue these bands and they will basically take effect immediately uh, and then they basically what happens is that uh, they will incoming transactions will be compared to the band list and if the object is older than the band then it's matched against the band before given to the client yeah that's I, I, I know it's not ideal to just do that orally uh, other neat stuff yeah soft bands that's yeah never mind I'm going to skip that uh, authentication and authorization in, in VCL and basic cryptography in VCL. I don't know if there are any Dutch newspapers that use Varnish for their paywalls, uh, but internationally there are, I think, 75 or 80 newspapers that moved their paywalls from being written in JavaScript, which is, if you know, sort of, if you if you're sort of into really really basic computer security, like shipping the, the the content off to the client and then asking the client politely not to display it is kind of dumb. <laughs> okay, um, but like uh, like my favorite example is the New York Times. Every time you talk to the New York Times, the New York Times will look at your the varnish will look at your request, look up your subscriber information if you're logged in. Uh, see if you have access to that content and then uh, if you don't have access it will count it towards your quota and if you're out of quota it will not give you that content that's sort of I think like that's about as far as I would push VCL uh, without it sort of becoming unmanageable 
I would not recommend writing a full CMS inside of Arch. Uh, yes. Also, yeah. Five minutes. Five minutes, yeah. Yes. Since you're in all interested in microservices, uh, I have this uh, pet, uh, we have this pet project. It's an open source project that's going to launch this month. Uh, so this is a, a, a microservice thing, installation. It has a, four microservices, Zoo, Foo, Bar, and Baz, uh, and it has a service directory. So this is etcd or something. Mongoose? Yeah, I don't I entirely know what they're, they're, they're all called. Um, we have a customer. So it's a media organization. They were really, they took the decision to re-implement everything as microservices in 2007. I think, don't think it was the, the term microservices was coined in 2007, but they did it like this. <clears throat> so instead of actually sort of, if foo needs to talk to bar, it will first look up the IP address in the service directory and then it will connect to bar. And if bar fails, then it's up to Foo to actually fix that, to find an alternative service, an alternative address. There's some, like, and then like these talk to each other and uh, think it's yeah, way too much. So the way they did it, these customers of ours, they put Varnish in the middle, and then they just connected every microservice to Varnish. Now, it's not entirely correct according to the sort of pattern because it's like should be fully distributed. And then, but the neat thing is that they got centralized caching in their microservice architecture. So they, could, they were able to make all their microservices completely stateless. And if they wanted to invalidate something, like invalidate everything that has to do with object 365. Boom, they could do that because the ca all the caching happened here. They could scale up this bit, this bit, this bit without an issue. They could also infer the timing of every microservices call and every microservices call in relation to each other. What was that Zipkin? What Zipkin does? If, you're, if you think this is interesting, come and see me and, and I'll show you something super neat. I think I'll just uh, draw the line there. Uh, yeah. So there's a slide that says thanks. So thank you very much for, uh, I think we have time for one question. Two. Two maybe, yeah. Anything? Is uh, support for HTTP2 uh, coming in front? Yeah, HTTP2 HTTP support is underway. Uh, that's, that's our, H I think uh, HTTP2 is going to be really interesting. Uh, what I sort of really dislike about HTTP2 is all the dynamic uh, properties uh, that are completely transient. Uh, so uh, proxies in HTTP2, they suffer a lot because you, you don't, uh, there's like, there's no, this like SMTP and, and mail headers. Uh, there's a lot of state in SMTP that's not described in the mail headers. Uh, and the same thing with HTTP2. There's a lot of state like priorities and push lists that are not apparent if you sniff the protocol, if you look at the, the HTTP2 headers. Uh, VCL is rather nice for dealing with those things. And I think, yeah, we will, we, I think our, I, I hope, hopefully we'll have something uh, at uh, Q3 or Q4 2016. Though we're not, uh, uh, quickest. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Yes, there was one more question. It was the same, was the same question. It was, it was the same question, yeah, okay. I have one other small question. Yes? Uh, the cache, how is it maintained? Is it the memory cache or is it the disk cache? Yeah, so it's a virtual memory cache. <laughs> so, so that means that it, uh, most, most of it, it's, it's, most of it is physical memory. Uh, it can be also uh, virtual memory backed by disk. Uh, that was sort of the initial idea behind Varnish, actually. But then it turns out we, we learned a lot about the CPUs that we didn't really know when we set out. Uh, 
So most 99% ins of the installations today, they use memory just by malloc'ing memory, basically. Yes. HTTP2 is, is encrypted by default. How does Varnish cope with it? Because it doesn't so HTTP2 is not encrypted by default. Um, IE does actually support unencrypted HTTP2, which basically means that for browsing porn, IE will be far superior to all the other browsers because it will be much faster. Because actually, like SSTLS, still slows the browser down significantly. The Huh? Yeah, yes, actually, uh, hopefully it will. So, uh, we have, we, we're not linking against OpenSSL because we think OpenSSL is a piece of shit. Uh, so that's our official policy on OpenSSL. Uh, we like the poor schmucks who work with OpenSSL, but it's not their fault, but it's just a, like too many doctorates have taken a dump on the code base, basically. Uh, so what we do is we have this uh, project called Hitch. So Hitch is a minim minimalistic event-driven TLS proxy that we install together with Varnish that does the TLS. That means whenever there's a bug in OpenSSL, and trust me, there will be more bugs in OpenSSL, uh, your Varnish installation is not compromised, but this minimalistic proxy might be. Yes, that's it. This weekend I've been to a concert where the bonus was almost longer than the concert itself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those moments. Okay. Thank you very much. This was very interesting. Oh, thank you.